Um, okay, everyone, uh, we'll start the seminar, but um, before we um, introduce today's speaker, let's go over some rules and logistics. Uh, first of all, please mute yourself during the talk uh, unless you have questions so that our speaker can talk without unnecessary interruptions. If you have questions, you are welcome to un unmute yourself and ask questions or use chat room to post to your questions so that we can address them in Q&A session at the end. Second, uh, no classified discussion is allowed here, so watch out. And finally, the talk today will be recorded and uploaded in our YouTube channel. All right, uh, that's about it. Now let me introduce our speaker. It is an honor to host today's speaker, Professor Nils uh, Theory. He is an associate professor at the Technical University of Munich. Um, he is actually an alumni of Lawrence Livermore, which I just found out. Uh, in fall of 2003, he did an intern uh, with uh, Dr. Dan Welch. Um, I'm, I'm not sure he's with us right now in, in this seminar or not, but I, I hope he, he does. But back then, he, he did the optimization. Um, he, he optimized, he tries to optimize the C++, C++ course. Now he focuses on deep learning methods for physical systems with an emphasis on fluid flow problems beyond latent space simulation algorithms and generative models he's currently and especially interested in learning algorithms powered by differentiable solvers if you get a chance please visit his webpage you will find a list of fascinated video clips with his beautiful fluid simulation Today, he will present differentiable physics simulations for deep learning, which is aligned with our core interest here. So we expect a great talk today. Now, without further ado, let me pass the baton to Professor Dury. Okay, here you go. It's all yours. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Exactly. It's great to be back, at least virtually, after doing the internship a long time ago. And today I want to focus on the topic that, that keeps my group and, and myself busy these days and which I find very interesting, this combination of physics relations and deep learning. I hope I can at least show you some first steps in, in that direction. Let me motivate the goal here very broadly. So I'll be focusing on, on physical phenomena like the air around us in the room you're sitting in. So I have a animation here. Right. Hopefully you see now the, the smoke rising here. Right. This is a very typical phenomenon. A classical example is the flow around an airfoil, one of the classical fluid mechanics problems, or also the, the glass of water we drink typically is modeled as a fluid, similar phenomena actually come up in, in a large variety of settings. So one that I also find very interesting is uh, robotic control. So here is an example of a uh, actuated fish, uh, fish-like shape that, that is supposed to swim forward in the water. So this is also closely related um, to these aforementioned topics. And I don't want to cover all the possible applications here, but it goes from thermodynamics or plasma physics medical simulations of blood flow in our body. So there's a large variety. I would argue with it's, it's something that is worth looking at. It comes up a lot. And I have to show the navier stokes equations at least once. So this will be the basis for many of the of the following examples. I don't want to go into detail, but these kinds of physical models is what what I'll be targeting with the simulations in the following. And we actually have very powerful methods for simulating effects like these. Now the question is basically, how do we combine that with deep learning? And I want to take a very, uh, in a way, a very pragmatic approach. So the physical models are definitely great. So that's, that's something to build on. I think we also have very powerful numerical methods. And 
developed over over a long time span. So also these, I think it's, it's worth keeping uh, as much as possible. And that basically means uh, leaves cleaning up the, the remaining mess for the machine learning method. And by mess, I mean, uh, for example, numerical errors or um, errors in observation, uncertainties. So this is how I think ideally these different parts should play together. Now, one of the one of the very interesting research questions is how to best make these, these three components work together in the end. Within this intersection of, of these different fields, um, before going to, into the details, I think it's also worth thinking about the different ways this could be done on a high level. And um, that's what I want to describe here. So we have a physical system. The kind of classical simulation just goes forward. We basically start with some initial and boundary conditions and then simulate forward in time to, to find out what happens. In uh, practice, many applications actually also pose inverse problems where we have these simulations, we have some constraints or requirements, and then we have some kind of ultra optimization loop to find a solution that satisfies these constraints. In the end, typically it's still built around a simulation that shares a lot of similarities, but is is much more complicated and in a way a very good target for for these uh, deep learning combinations as I'll show later on. But right, these two ways forward or, or backward in a way are types of simulations I'll be considering. And then the question is how to combine it with these deep learning methods. And one straightforward way is what, what I call supervised in the following, basically treating these simulators as um, providers of data. So we can collect large amounts of data and train classical machine learning or deep learning approaches. Um, but as indicated by this bar here, the, the connection is not very tight. What is a bit more tightly integrated is if we use the models we have for the simulations in, in the loss terms as, as soft constraints essentially for the learning process. That allows us to incorporate more of the physics. But what I want to argue in the following is that ideally we really very tightly interleave these two. So ideally there shouldn't be much of a boundary between learning and, and simulation. It's also worth mentioning that by now this is a field that is receiving a lot of interest. And here is just a selection of some of the by now more classical works in this area. I want to focus on two on, of my group uh, here at the top. Um, these two works by, by Philip and Kiwon um, who were the primary uh, PhD and, and postdoc working on this and also some additional collaborators shown here. Um, so these two, I think, will, will be good examples to illustrate this, this topic. And to give an overview directly, what's the goal here talking about these differentiable physics simulations? We typically have some CDE called P in the following that, that captures the physical model we're interested in. Um, with some state S, for example, over time, on which this PDE works. And now the key quantity that is, is really useful to have here, a bit similar to classical joint optimization, is that we have a gradient of this simulation with respect to state S. So we'd like to know, for some change of a state, how do we need to change the input to get that desired change? And it's not something that all simulators necessarily provide, but if we have such a gradient, as I'll show later on, this actually lets us combine the simulation very, very neatly with the deep learning process. Right, so the basis is that we, we might have to upgrade our simulator if we provide this quantity, um, but I, I hope I can show a bit that it's, that it's worth doing that or considering it. And if you have such a formulation, you could also imagine actually that putting a residual or so of, of the physical model into the loss of the training, but this is actually not what, what I want to, what to aim for in the following. Yeah, in this way we can actually achieve a very tight integration of the two. So the first example that I want to give here is, is this solver in the loop project, as, as we've called it. And the idea here is essentially to learn to reduce numerical errors. So working under the assumption that these errors have some, some structure, there's some 
pattern to learn some repeating signal um, in these errors. And we want to basically use the neural network to learn how these errors behave. And this is purely done synthetically, so it could be potentially done for real data, but we're working here on, on simulated data. So we assume we have some reference here shown in blue. These are essentially reference states here of some phase-based trajectory shown in blue coming from some higher order solver that, that we have with our disposal. And then in addition, we have some more approximate version of it. We have what, what I call in the following uh, source version of this. This is indicated by this blue, I do have a point here by this orange blob here. This, I hope you can see a bit from these, from these rough rectangles. This is supposed to be, for example, course discretization could also be a lower order method. Um, hopefully it's faster than this reference, but due to the course approximation also introduces some errors. And what's important to note here is that the trajectory of this orange curve now, of this orange phase-based trajectory now differs from something that you would directly project from this reference um, solution manifold essentially into the into the source version um, because these numerical errors it's a, typically an iterative process they accumulate and then over these iterated computations give us something that's potentially quite different from the original trajectory and the goal is to now reach something that is closer to the blue one so in this case um, shown as this green curve. So here we still use this approximate solver, this orange uh, source simulator, but we want to prove it such that it yields a result that is closer to this reference we're interested in. And right, this modification now will be done by, by a neural network to close the gap towards these reference solutions. And what's worth pointing out here right away, having this picture on is that this is actually a tough task because from a machine learning standpoint, we actually have shifting distributions of input features. So if you think of these simulations as inputs to a machine learning model in neural network, then these source simulations typically look different from these reference, um, these reference solutions. So typically the high dimensional is very difficult to analyze and, and visualize, but if we imagine this is a very simple 1D space, for example, the low resolution version might have some higher uh, low frequency content as a reference, more high frequency content. So there's definitely some difference in terms of what these solvers do. And we now want our model to work with some corrected, some modified distribution because it should start with the source, but get away from it towards the reference. But this version here, interaction of the model and our simulator, this actually does not exist beforehand. Because these versions in the middle, this, this green distribution comes from using the trained neural network in conjunction with the solver. And if we would do this naively, especially with pre-computation, then our model would basically learn to rely on, on these sources. And later on, when we try to apply it, worst case, um, blow up and with things are fine, maybe give us something that's not too different from this source version. Um, but again, this is actually a case where this using these differentiable solvers is a very useful tool to avoid these problems. Yeah, so to formalize that a bit, we have our PDE and our solution, solution manifold for the reference in blue and this orange the manifold in, in uh, orange on the right-hand side. And we assume that we have some operator that maps from the reference to the source space called P in the following. The sequence of steps is then basically obtained by repeatedly applying our, our discrete uh, version of the PDE called PS here for the source um, over n time steps to obtain a solution after an update step, for example, starting from projected uh, reference state here. And in addition, um, We'll also have a learned function called C here in the following to, to note a correction function. This is conditioned on some set of, of parameters, theta. This is the, are the parameters of the neural network and we get some, some state, some uh, phase space point of our uh, simulation as input. And now the, the main objective in 
So one way to write it down is to basically um, aim for minimizing the L2 distance between the simulated trajectories and the projected um, reference states, including the correction in between. So um, in a way, um, on, on purpose, we have a very simple combination here. So we just take these states and add an output of the network on top. Potentially, you could have some more complicated operations here, but the network in itself is already nonlinear, and we assume that we have some additive correction in the problem. Yeah, so the goal is to minima minimize the difference between these two overall states um, over time. Yeah, so to come back to this very simple supervised example, it's also good to put that in context here. Um, in this case, we have our reference solver. We compute a large amount of data. We use a source solver to compute the same, uh, to, to, to set up the same um, initial conditions and obtain the course approximation of these solutions. And then we can train a network just based on these differences. So the network, this orange arrow here, the C function now basically just sees the difference between these reference states and the output and as shown before. And then in any deep learning framework, we have gradients for all the operations of a neural network. So this is just back propagated um, towards the weights theta to obtain an update and basically train the network to, to minimize the difference of these two. But as you can see, the solvers are all in the data generation step at the top. They're not playing any role in the in the training process, which I think is a, is a pity in a way. Um, and right, this is something to move away from. And then we can iterate this process. So with these residual formulations, we can do a bit better. So here we can then look at the network and now have some residual formulation of our PDE in the loss. Again, minimizing the difference towards the reference, this is unmodified, but now we basically back propagate through both this residual in the loss and then propagate the gradient that we obtained at the output of the network basically further into the network to update the weights, similar to before. And now we basically have our physical model in the residual or parts of it. Um, and one of the one of the nice side effects here is that um, in many cases, we can directly use derivatives of this neural network to formulate the residual. But also as visible in the, the color scheme here, again, this, the whole solver actually comes not into play here. So especially if you think about the time iteration, evolution, evolution over time, we don't actually use the solver or information from it in the training process. We have some version of the of the physical model of the PDE, but not the actual solver. And right, this is what I want to um, now um, make use of here. So having a solver that gives us this gradient um, is actually, I would also argue, a, a good thing because we can choose the a good discretization, having knowledge about the physical model about numerical methods that we want to use, we can set up our solver and then also the calculation of the gradient to use the numerical methods, the accuracies, and the orders that we would like to get for our approximation. Um, side point here is that we typically need to take care not to make this too fine-grained. We don't want like, every addition multiplication to be taken into account, but something on the order of, of time steps or larger um, larger updates within our solver typically makes sense. And a good example is a, is a classical Poisson solve here. So if we have um, a linear system with a Laplace matrix and we're interested in inverting that. So if we, as a solution, actually want to compute A inverse times some right-hand side B, if we are now interested in this gradient, so the derivative with respect to B is that actually just leave the exact same inversion of, of the matrix A. And if we have some um, some efficient iterative solver to compute this inverse matrix, a multigrip method, or, or a CG solver, then we can actually use the same efficient solver both for the forward and the backward uh, path in the setup. 
and right, having basically a well chosen method here to proceed also then makes the learning process later on much faster. Yeah, and once we have done this for some pieces in our simulation, then typically it's actually quite easy to um, to put together these different steps with um, with automatic differentiation of some of the deep learning packages. Oh, and I just saw that there's a um, there's a question about Richardson extrapolation. Um, I would argue that it's a very different process and with the, with Richardson extrapolation it's also aiming for uh, reducing the errors um, but here we have a whole neural network that is added to a solution and that is in a way very problem dependent and trained to minimize the errors just for that set of cases that it's seen at a training time in the end it's also basically added on top um, with a similar goal, but a very different representation of, of reducing the error. So potentially less generic, but I would hope that actually by training this correctly, you could, could do better than a rigid uh, extrapolation. I haven't, we haven't compared this in, in particular for these examples. Uh, that would be interesting to try. Yeah. So in this context here, we are looking at the time evolution. So we have some roll out of our simulator. And now the main difference is that we not only have a PDE, but also the function C that depends on, on the states we're producing. So this is one of the key changes here. The, the solver basically determines the phase-based trajectories we get. And now having a PDE solver and some potentially non-trivial uh, nonlinear function in, in our neural network, will most likely give us very different evolutions of our system. And this is basically also what we need to, to work with as a basis for corrections in order to stick to the reference. So these states here are now denoted with this uh, tilde to distinguish them from the kind of plain um, source simulation state. And now right, the correction function actually works with these modified states as tilde as inputs and needs to learn to adjust to, to their content. In a way, the, the minimization itself looks very similar to before, with an important difference now being that we use these modified states as inputs to our system, which actually depend on what the correction function has, has produced beforehand. I think visually, it is in a way much easier to, to see the now the main idea, as, as often mentioned uh, as a goal before, is we, we really directly use the solver in this training group. And now for, for one single update of the network weights, we can start with some um, uh, projected uh, reference configuration, evaluate a network, and then pass it through the solver. And we really do this up to, up to the end times we're interested in, as much as, as our computational uh, resources allow. Then we can go in and now check what solutions we obtained and how the loss, what the loss looks like over the course of the um, evolution. And for each of these, we can now, with the right solver, actually backpropagate through the simulation. So we have the adjoint of the, of the whole um, solver in the training process. We get a gradient. This is backpropagated into the network to update the weights. And the loss is actually also computed. Okay. And here we can now use this, this suitable, hopefully well-chosen discretization of our solver, both for the forward set and for the adjoint method, um, for the adjoint of the solver. And we do actually, in this case, have a loss for every step in between, having reference states um, from our from some reference solver. And, and all of these updates of the of the theta weights are typically accumulated. So all these together give us one single update of, of the network weights. And um, what what really is the key difference here to, to the previous two methods is that in this case, in a way, the correction function sees its effect over time. This is really in a way computing a full simulation with n steps at a training time. And hence you can imagine that 
if this deviates, we'll actually see it in the loss and the correction function where we get a signal to respect um, these changes that occur over, over the time evolution. And all of this is done for one single update step. So at the end, we have one gradient for that uh, network weight theta, and then we can keep on iterating here um, to over time train our network to right, hopefully bring down the whole error across these across these different states. Yeah. And um, right. for for chaotic systems, I think this is an interesting question. Maybe I show some more examples. I think it's a good uh, good point for an for an outlook. Yeah. Let me show some some simple examples first. Um, not too too chaotic for now. So um, a nice example is a, a simple wake flow. So we have a, a rectangular domain. We have some inflow with a with a round uh, uh, obstacle in the in the lower half. We have a certain range of Reynolds numbers as training data and some new Reynolds numbers um, as test data. And here on the right, you can now see the, the reference versions at the bottom and these coarser approximations of the floor space at the top. And this is already a good point to look a bit at the differences. So here, you can just compute the mean absolute error um, between these two. So this is these, this number of, of uh, 0.14 uh, between the two um, states here. And this now basically quantifies a bit how, how different the solutions are. Visually, it's very obvious. And right, in terms of, um, of direct errors, so there's some normalized, um, there are some normalized quantities here. And now if we bring in the solver, so uh, the solver in the loop model, so the train neural network, for this case, we can actually get solutions that are very close to the reference. And in this case, we get a significantly lower error of 0 0.013. And visually, I think it's hard to distinguish. And these numbers now are also useful to, um, to illustrate these shifting distributions. So this uh, blurred out source version, um, from this, from this um, solution manifold that I showed initially, this is now basically this 0 0.14 uh, away from the reference, at least in terms of its mean. And this learned corrected version is now much closer. So it, we, we really can measure the distance, at least in terms of the mean here. And by training with the solver in the process here, that basically makes it possible to um, to learn from that shifted distribution. So if we set it up correctly and the learning process actually converted, then in the end, the network will actually have learned to work with these changing states and to, to use those states as input to produce a, a good reference distribution. Um, there's also, I can show this in motion here. This is the forest version. Um, sorry, this is a lower range number case for the forest on the left, the reference on the right. And in the middle, there's this hybrid that uses the source solver. So it's actually based on the same version as the right one, but with that added correction from the neural network. And this is the higher range number case. And visually, I think um, it's good to see that uh, these are very close and but the, the numbers, um, you can find uh, more de additional details in the paper if you're interested there. And it's also worth mentioning that this uh, joint training with the solver actually um, improves the generalization, which I think is a very important aspect of it. So it's a slightly different uh, setup here. We have a, basically some, some passively effective quantity that we assume it's hot, some simple buoyancy model with the Zunesk approximation. And in this case, um, we could test out a bit how, flex, how well this model works with different boundary conditions. And um, I think this, this did work quite well. Um, one of the reasons being that having the solver 
in the training basically allows the network also to see or generate from changing states different configurations of the simulator and training time. And that typically helps robustness and avoids overfitting to the specific inputs um, in, in some input data. Yeah, I briefly want to come back to these different approaches here um, to, to make the difference a bit clearer. So with the supervised approach, basically, right, we, we cannot use any numerical methods easily. It's just based on the data, and right there, there's no model behind it. And with the, oh, sorry, with the, um, right, the physics-informed approaches with some additional loss terms, we can use, make use of the model in the training. But again, because um, this is typically used using your networks to formulate our PDE, this basically prevents us from using a large portion of numerical methods um, that typically don't work with neural networks. And in a way, with this, with this differential physics approach, we, we're relying on a full kind of regular solver, um, both for, for predictions and for getting information about the training. So here we can actually use the existing numerical tools that we have and so it shows a bit on the on the representation for each. So the supervised approach actually would um, is in a way the most flexible. We could do this for 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 anything for any kind of mesh. I'll actually only show uh, regular Cartesian meshes in the following. Potentially, also this could be a more unstructured mesh in a way that uh, would transfer quite nicely. These uh, these physics informed constraints typically work with fully connected neural networks, it's quite a different representation. And um, right, this interleaving also typically uses a regular mesh where we can then use right, some pseudo discretization on, on that mesh directly. Yeah. Um, this I just briefly mentioned so far that there is this look ahead in the in the time evolution. So in every Step of the training, we basically unroll the, the physical prediction to let the network get a signal how the system evolves. And this is compared here on this slide. So the supervised training here, that is the, the version that basically just uses pre-computed data. In this case, it's actually showing the improvement between the source and the reference states. So starting from the source, just to have it in in a direct um, in a direct comparison, this is now a relative improvement over the over the source inputs, and it doesn't do badly. It gives us a like, roughly 30% improvement, but right, that's not too close to the references. And if we include the solver with four steps, we had 41%, and in this case, it actually paid off to train with uh, 128 steps um, of the solver um, in every single update of the network. In this case, we actually get more than, than twice the improvement of the, of the supervised version. So in this case, it really paid off to have very long predictions. Also makes it considerably more expensive to train the network. But the hope is that if we train this for, for an interesting space, one that is general enough to be interesting for, for a variety of, of new inputs, then hopefully we can use this trained model many times in the future so that this this one-time cost is offset. And the three case is also interesting because there we see more clear problems of the of the supervised approach in, in 2D actually worked relatively well with the 30% improvement. If we try to do the same for a 3D flow, so again, this weight flow with a cylinder in this case, um, as you can see here on the left, the network really leads to not a complete blow up, but but to very strong artifacts, and it's most likely actually caused by these shifting uh, shifting distributions in the input, and um, especially you know, in the direct comparison, the hybrid version with the solver in the loop model um, behaves much closer to the to the reference solution here again shown on the right hand side. Um, it does not show up that much in the, in the terms of the mean absolute error, but this would be interesting to analyze with respect to other um, other metrics as well. Um, 
Yeah. Oh, and uh, also one fun fact worth mentioning here in the paper, we showed it with a white background. And that actually nicely showed that it's uh, more about fish, uh, smoking cigars. But yeah, so side note, what is worth uh, another comment is the performance, because in the end, also all this training here actually uses the these reference states as as a training goal. So we assume that we actually have some synchronized simulation where we have the uh, guiding signal towards reference for the different source states. And having this in a way is a question of, of computational resources. So it's more expensive, but we wanted to pay off in terms of the resources that we need to produce either each of these um, different solutions. And for the 3D flow, actually, the numbers are still fairly clear. So here we had a CPU based uh, solver that took around 900 seconds. And only the source solver um, with, with the neural network um, take around 13, 14 seconds. So this is a nice speed up. And um, of course, this is comparing a CPU version to one that partially uses the, the GPU. So this is not fully fair. Uh, to be fair, both are also not uh, super optimized. I think there's uh, plenty of room on, on both of these sides um, to further speed things up. And also this reference solver is still a relatively simple one. I could imagine that for more complicated ones, actually the, the time would go up a lot also for um, for larger gaps in terms of resolution with the super linear scaling, I think these um, reference states, states could become very expensive and we could see larger speed up. And one other thing that I think is worth mentioning here is also that for these neural networks at the moment, at least, I think it's very promising to, or not a bad idea, to rely on future hardware. Um, I think these the, the recent Macs that came out are a nice indicator um, they actually had a, a, a nice number of, of dedicated units for evaluating neural networks. So if we have a trained model here, I think at least for the next couple of years, we'll see uh, massive improved, a massively improved uh, support in hardware for evaluating these models. So I would expect that this model, even without any changes, will run potentially much faster on, on future architectures. Yeah, um, so this was in a way a relatively controlled setup, learning to reduce these numerical errors. I want to mention a, um, a second approach uh, that is quite in line, but targets a slightly different goal for, for control from the following paper here. And here the goal is a bit, the, the learning goal is a bit less direct. So yeah, I imagine that, that the setup is we have some kind of um, room with with an airflow, and imagine the fire breaks out, and now we have some exhaust valves that we can control. So indicated by the green arrows here, so we cannot directly modify um, the, the air or the smoke here, but we want to now control these valves such that the smoke is, for example, blown out of out of the closest window. And so this is now less direct. Before, with, this, with the numerical errors, we could basically just add things anywhere in our solution. And here now we need to control these in and outlets such that the smoke is, for example, blowing in a certain direction. This turned out to be a, um, a substantially more difficult problem. So here we cannot rely on a single network anymore. But the time also makes this quite challenging. We still kept it relatively simple, setting a fixed um, a fixed time interval and, and reaching the target after a fixed number of, of time steps and of a fixed horizon. But within that time horizon of again n steps, the, the evolution is actually not constrained at all. In a way, we don't care how the system evolves over time as long as the goal in the end is reached. And that complexity actually required a second network that in a way you can see it as a plan. It basically predicts what state we'd like to reach at one of the one of the intervals in time. And then we have a second network which now is a bit more similar to the previous one that actually acts 
that, for example, changes these these um, exhausts. And like from that, we get a new state, and then the first network can again predict what we'd like to get out for the for the remaining time, and then the second network can correct. So it's a predictor corrector scheme essentially. Despite this, is actually trained in a very similar way. So now we have right, this action network called CFE here, again taking the current state as input and, and having a certain number of weights. In this case, it also needs to know about the target, target and the time. It's a slightly different input, but relatively similar. One of the key differences in learning now is that we really only have a loss for the final states. So before we had basically these, these aligned um, data sets, and here now we just have some final goal state that we'd like to reach. Um, so the loss is really, in this case, or needs to back propagate from the final state all the way through this underworld sequence um, to update the weights in the network. These are then um, really evaluated still for every every one of the time steps, such that the network can act on the on the different in between as well. That's right. Visually, I think it shows that the whole unrolling process with this differentiable solver, solver is is quite similar to before. Yeah, so uh, this is now our our fire setup, um, looking a bit simpler here. So this is a 2D Navier-Stokes simulation, 128 squared, um, over 16 time steps. And what's also worth mentioning, in a way, right, this being a control problem for deep learning, you might uh, intuitively think of, of uh, reinforcement learning as a tool here. But um, we have actually some, we have tried to compare a bit. Um, but this is extremely difficult for reinforcement learning. Despite this relatively simple setup, we have more than 5,000 um, continuous control parameters here. So this is a very large action space, as we call it in, in RL. And um, hence, it's actually it's, it's very unstable with these methods. And here, but you can basically rely on the solver and on, on directional information from the solver. So this, we are able to train quite uh, nicely with the, with the differential physics approach. And here are different samples from our test set, different initial configurations, and basically different windows selected uh, at the top of the domain. And as uh, we can see here, that the network basically adds these forces on the outer blue side to push around the fluid in the middle and to move it towards um, one of the one of the outlets at the top. Yeah, um, this is this is basically what I want to mention for this uh, control project. There are additional uh, examples potentially. Again, in the, in the supplemental material of the paper, or also for some other um, systems like like Burgers equation, um, but showing these two examples, I think it's a good point to to give an outlook. So, what we are also quite interested in as as next steps is to look at real data. As mentioned before, both of these examples I've shown use with synthetic data, so simulated inputs, but it would be really interesting to use real world data, some, some measured um, flows. And we actually have a small capture set up for this um, with a with a fork machine. So some, some visual flows. Um, you can see it here in this orange outlet. Sorry. Now it's playing. So again, producing some some hot um, hot air plumes, basically. These we can reconstruct with some traditional convex optimization schemes, and we have a nice collection of these uh, captured real-world flows. And this will be a very interesting direction to use similar learning with model equations to reconstruct or learn from these uh, real-world flows. There are also some interesting synergies between vision and graphics applications. So looking at time evolutions, we also had um, one, one step at, at super resolution techniques for, for videos, video beam time signals. And here, a version that actually also again takes the time evolution into account is 
shown at the top right here, this hexagonal approach, um, while the input in this case is the lower left, so it's very pixelated as you can see, and the ground truth is shown at the bottom right, some previous work at the, at the top left. Um, I think that this is also a nice, uh, nice base for, um, for, for combined work. And in the long run, I think what uh, will be a very interesting challenge, of course, the goal is to scale this up to really large simulations. I've shown uh, relatively small ones here. Um, this is an example from one of our earlier works where we also had a super resolution network for these um, smoke flows for scalar transport. And in this case, it's a 3D CNN that is just used in, in different places of the simulation. Here we had around a thousand cells uh, across one axis. So over time, this really produces uh, billions of, of cells. And scaling these methods up to these and much larger systems, I think, will be an interesting uh, challenge because typically, because of all the nonlinearities, um, it can be difficult and things don't often, uh, don't, don't always work out as expected. Um, but of course, I think it's really an interesting uh, and a, a very important goal for practical applications. Yeah. So, with that, I also want to come to, to a conclusion. So I hope I was able to demonstrate a bit that having these differentiable solvers is a good tool to bridge simulations and learning. And we have the deep learning components on one side and the numerical methods and physical models on the other side. Um, I showed this error correction and control task. Um, one outlook that I also want to mention here is numerical weather prediction. In a way, also very complex fluid systems where we have some data, actually not that much if you think about it in terms of learning, but I think this will be a very interesting and important challenge um, to, to use similar ideas for predicting weather and climate. And one, one of the key messages to, to Phrase it very bluntly in a way is to write, tear down borders between these different parts that we have here. So I think there's no, no good reason to see these as separated systems, but ideally we, we have a free flow of information. So the actual signal or actual solution, but also any higher order derivatives that we might need are the ideally passed without any problems between learning and, and uh, simulator component. And there's a nice, Citation here from a Norwegian explorer that he actually meant for, for borders in the real world, which are arguably even more important, but I think it's a nice mindset also for simulations um, to ideally not have any artificial borders between a right, deep learning and a, and a simulator. And in the long run, um, Bringing these two together should also, or hopefully, also improve our understanding of these uh, processes. Um, this, I think, is potentially a very exciting and important goal in the long run. Um, and I haven't, I haven't even touched here properly the, the problems that arise, but um, I think that there is a decent hope that we as humans can actually also learn from these trained models. It's not just a black box. We can analyze it. It is some representation in a computer. And hopefully these will actually at some point also give us better understanding and, and potentially better models or uh, insights about what happens in, in nature around us. So as, as a very long-term goal. And with that, yeah, I want to thank you for your attention. The examples I've shown here were actually done with our um, differential solver called Fiveflow, which you can find under the link here if you're interested. This is an open source project. And uh, feel free to try it out and let us know how it works. And at this point, I'd also like to, to thank the, my collaborators again and the funding by the, the USC and Intel. And thanks for listening. I'd be happy to answer some questions. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a really interesting talk and definitely I totally agree with you. Um, we need more research on this direction. Okay, we have a um, many questions on the chat room. Uh, so oh, right. let's start uh, with uh, Jeremy's question. 
Okay, um, is the reducing numerical error solver in the loop procedure analogous to Richardson extrapolation? Is the cost comparable? I think you comment on that before. Right, this I briefly commented on. I think it is quite different. So I don't have the exact cost for, for Richardson extrapolation in mind, but instead of relying on a on a direct extrapolation of the solver here we basically need to only evaluate this network um, it's worth keeping in mind that for this one and for other works at the moment they're actually not that tiny they typically have a fair number of degrees of freedom and so it's also definitely not for free but keeping hardware in mind i i do have a hope that in the end they will be very efficient to evaluate in a way, it's a very structured process evaluating the uh, regular fully connected neural networks or convolutional ones. Um, but I think overall, it's, it's quite different. Okay. Uh, the next question from Park Xiang. Uh, do the high resolution simulation and the low resolution simulation need to be synchronized in their state space in order to prepare the training data? That's also a good question. So um, what we need is a discretization of the same PDE. So we do need basically different solvers for the same problem formulation. Um, I haven't mentioned it in the talk, but the, the reference space, that is actually relatively, uh, could be considered as a black box. So in a way, this could be pre-computed. We need some reference data, but it could also maybe even come, come from some experiment for measurements. But then we need a process that basically tries to recreate these reference states and makes errors. And then we'd like to close the gap between the two. So as such, we do need some synchronization and this approximate version of it that we actually need in a differentiable way in the training process. Okay, uh, another one from Bob Xiang. Uh, would gradient blow or diminish in iterative computation? Yes, it is. It is definitely more difficult to train because potentially your PDE is very nonlinear. You have a nonlinear uh, neural network that interacts with it, or modifies it. And so this is difficult to train. However, in practice, um, we, we also discussed it a bit in the paper. What, for example, works nicely to stabilize it is that you build up the time evolution. You could, in the extreme case, actually pre-compute a supervised model and then slowly add more and more steps over time. If you directly try to work with 100 simulation steps and an untrained model, then it's bound to blow up. But building it up in this way actually works quite uh, stably in practice. Okay, um, here is a question from Greg. Is there a limitation where there is a portion of the initial condition space is chaotic? Uh, that is near neighbor initial conditions produce divergent answers in the well-resolved simulation cause trouble for the method? Uh, so uh, that's also a good question. So one of the one of the key advantages of this differential physics approach is actually that we don't um, we don't just average over different potentially chaotic modes of a solution, um, but we get a gradient for the current the current state of our system. And if things go well, actually we can find solutions that then recreate particular parts of, of the solution manifold, whereas in, in normal supervised learning, you would basically pre-compute scattered points of, of these chaotic uh, states and then average them out to learn some mean, uh, which I think in many applications would be worse. Um, however, I can imagine that if, if the space is very chaotic, then it, it will be very difficult to learn. Um, so it's definitely challenging if you have chaotic systems, but I think compared to some something simpler like supervised, um, I think it's a good idea to have have gradients of information from a solver. Okay, another question from Xiao Wu. Um, it's a similar question. 
How did you deal with the instability for adjoint for chaotic system? Um, we actually did not um, see specific instabilities in the in the adjoints themselves in these uh, computation. Um, in, in the example that I've shown, so typically the learning process was the was the more fragile component of the two. I could imagine that for um, for cases where this is problematic, um, um, the, the, the classic literature on, on a joint method maybe has some solutions there, or but having um, basically having this, this symmetry between the forward solve and the backward solve potentially, and um, we can stabilize both with similar methods together. Um, but we actually haven't encountered that in, in our tests so far. Okay. Um, question from Lloyd. Uh, can you comment on how transferable this method is when you wish your neural network to span a space of simulation, say varying with a Reynolds number in the context of CFD? Can you train in parallel across multiple simulations solving slightly different problems? So regarding generalization, I think it's a very important point. And in a way, the, the disappointing answer that I, I have to give here is that normally these these networks don't don't magically transfer to to new uh, to new inputs. Rather, what from our experience is very important is that you set up the training to cover typical inputs that you want to work with later on. Um, that being said, I think it is actually having a solver in the loop is actually a very powerful tool and you can make it very generic by a training time providing randomized varying initial conditions such that the network sees typical different inputs. And um, I've, I've briefly shown this example with the hot smoke. Th that model actually did very nicely work with input conditions that were very different from the ones that um, the, the training data set. But I think it's important to basically set up the training process to really show these or, or some similar conditions at training time. If you only train with a certain type of inputs and then later on completely change it and hope that the model works on something very different, that typically does, does not work. And in a way, the models are good at adapting to, to the cases they seen and uh, they have seen and basically focus on minimizing the errors. Um, they they're given for the for the inputs. Um, so I, I think that, that's important to keep in mind when setting up the training. Okay. Um, question from Brenda: Can you elaborate on the design of your CNN? Um, uh, how how uh, are you injecting this knowledge into the also your control problem? Was that done in the context of supervised learning or reinforcement learning? And so it's a fully convolutional CNN and injecting the physics knowledge is really done with the solver. So there is no additional magic in the CNN. The CNN is a very simple one. He is really having the solver that provides a gradient to the output of the CNN. And it's, it, we haven't, I haven't used or shown any, any of the RL examples here. We have some internally um, for, for simpler problems. They typically work quite badly. Um, so training with software here typically paid off quite a bit. Um, and I think you could call it partially un unsupervised because for many of these cases, the, the solutions are computed on the fly. So it's not basically just using uh, pre-computed data. Um, right. Although this, this unsupervised area in classic machine learning also is a bit vague, because I would argue actually in, in the end you always need some signal to supervise the network. It's more of a question whether it's computed on the fly or traditionally the computer, computer computation is what's called supervised. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, 
this question from can you comment on memory scaling related to back propagating uh, through a time integrator um it definitely requires more memory and we haven't benchmarked it in in full detail but you can you can basically estimate that you need on the order of the time step with in between for your for your network and for your solver um, and then like potentially a bit more overhead for um, for things like um, for additional normalization or or um, whatever momentum terms or so that your optimizer includes so um these are typically needed for the back propagation, right? For 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 uh, computing the derivative to typically the, the space that you obtained in a forward pass. Um, you could partially recompute those, but it's re it's quite memory intensive, as are actually uh, neural networks typically, uh, especially CNNs can produce a lot of basically a lot of data in terms of some abstract features in the in the hidden layers. And so that can lead to some uh, substantial memory overhead. I mean, in practice, we we haven't optimized that much. I could I think it could be reduced, um, but it definitely requires, on the order of this unrolling of time steps, uh, more memory. Okay. Uh, from James, what were the challenges of getting? Pi flow to work with the auto differentiation in PyTorch or TensorFlow? That's a good question too. I think there were no um, there were no inherent challenges, but also for us it was a bit of a learning process to learn how these frameworks work. Um, so actually a very straightforward way to implement these solvers would be to just take the basic operations they write tender additional applications and so on from, from these frameworks and um, then realizing right, an every Stokes solver with those. It turns out that is, that is a very bad idea that is very slow. We actually do have a CG solver, I think, in PyFlow that just uses basic uh, TensorFlow operations. And to some extent, it's interesting to also backprop through the full CG solve, but um, in a way, having some knowledge of the solver and knowing which states are interesting, it's typically important to um, not not expose all those intermediate states to uh, to some framework like TensorFlow, and if if we know that we don't that we're not interested in any of these intermediates, then we can not store them, not um, not keep um, the, the the forward path solutions in memory. So for efficiency, that actually is quite important. I would say to to think a bit about which States are important where we need the gradient and which should be kept in memory. Okay, uh, the question from Rob. Uh, it's clear that having a differentiable physics solver can lead to some very nice methods as you have shown today. The challenge for complex coupled multi physics solvers, which may be comprised of multiple physics libraries and sub components, how do we introduce differentiation throughout this complex software? And numerical method chain is automatic differentiation a viable approach for large multi-physics codes? In your opinion, I have to admit I don't think I can reliably answer that on the spot. I think this, this sounds very challenging, and I think it also depends on, on what your multi-physics system co consists of. I think it is worth investigating, and I think this is also very interesting question for, for future research, how to best compute certain quantities that, that guide learning across very complex and nonlinear uh, simulators. But definitely in such a case, I think you would need to be very careful with, with set sizes, with vanishing or uh, exploding gradients. Um, so I, it sounds difficult, um, but right, I, I think it's very also very problem dependent, unfortunately. So I think great topic for research, but out of the box, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, all right. Well, Martin asked a question, but um, he thinks you have already answered. So with that, I, I don't okay. have any more questions. 
uh, unless you, someone asks you directly to your private chat room, uh, ah, would I, you quickly check whether anyone? I don't know. I don't think you have additional questions. No, I don't think there are any additional ones. Okay. Well, with that, I, I think, well, let's thank uh, our today's speaker, Neil. Uh, it was a wonderful talk and we really appreciate it. Um, yeah, applause. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah. Uh, thank you for listening. And hopefully in the future, yeah. the pandemic uh, situation gets better and we can actually host you in person. Uh, that hopefully hopefully that, that, that it's going to happen in the future. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. And bye, thank everyone. You, bye, everyone. And thank you, everyone, uh, to joining uh, our seminar today. Okay. Bye. Goodbye. Oh, hi, Neil. Um, would you, are, are you still there? Yeah. Yes, I'm. Would you, would you send the slide today? Because uh, I have to go through some review and approval ah, okay. process in order to upload it into the YouTube. So, okay, yes, I think I can. I still have a PDF. For me. Okay. I think I can send it to you. Really. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. Sounds good. Thank you okay. again, Neil. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Bye.